but fear not. We have the settings arranged so that it will only record those of us who are unmuted and speaking in the little yellow box. So you will not be part of that recording. Um, you just need to stay muted. Um, regarding that, if you have any questions throughout the evening, please use the chat box to type them in. Davith and I will be saving up audience questions and we will pose them for you at the end of the event. So please make liberal use of that chat box. Um, and then also we just wanted to say a really big thank you to all of you. Um, it has been a, a long and weird and hard year in the annals of independent bookselling and small businesses generally. Um, and we're still here. We're still able to have events like this. And that is really thanks to all of you. We, we have seen incredible loyalty and support from our customers over this past year and the North Shire's continued existence owes itself to you. Thank you all so much for that support in the world to us. Um, before we get started with Davith introducing our authors, I'm actually going to hand things over to another wonderful friend of the North Shire book, Maria Krabka. Uh, Maria is the director of Saratoga Plan, who have helped us to spread the word about this event and are an amazing local not-for-profit um, supporting land conservation. Um, and you can support Saratoga Plan at the registers in the Saratoga store all month this month. Um, we are asking customers to round up their change when they purchase books from us to donate that spare change to Saratoga Plan. So um, Maria, thank you for being here and for your support. And please uh, let, let us know a little bit about what you do. Sure, sure. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, Saratoga Plan, it stands for Preserving Land and Nature, and it preserves the rural character the natural habitats and the scenic beauty of Saratoga County so that these irreplaceable assets are accessible to all and survive for future generations as they have in the past serving as the homelands of the Mohican, Mohawk and Abenaki people. Saratoga Plan together with its uh, partners throughout the county preserves farmland, natural areas, forests, waters, and trails that are compatible with natural resource protection. We've been called a small but quietly effective organization um, whose momentum continues to grow and the, the pace is increasing, and which is what we really need to do. Saratoga County being the fastest growing county in New York State for decades um, has a lot of resources coming here to convert land uh, for development purposes. So uh, we also need to pick up the pace. And I see a lot of friendly names here in the audience. And so thank all of you for supporting Saratoga Plan and making it possible to conserve land and bring people together. I calculated um, in, in reading Tony's book uh, and just wanted to see where we were at. Um, we're at about a 10% uh, protected land in the county, permanently protected land. And about half of that is farmland and the rest of it is, is natural areas. So we have a long way to go, but uh, we're very hopeful. And as we continue to think bigger, um, as uh, his work uh, encourages us to do, I think that um, there's some bold initiatives on the horizon. I urge all of you to talk to your, count, your town supervisors and your city council members um, to really invest heavily in our green infrastructure and um, go after some of those big federal dollars and state dollars that are available right now if we all work together. So um, with that, I'll just say thank you to Northshire for the uh, checkout change. Um, and although, you know, rounding up to the nearest dollar, uh, you know, won't I won't amount to a lot of funding, Saratoga Plan is able to leverage every dollar uh, raised into $10 of conservation. So thank you all. Thanks so much, Maria. Um, I really appreciate that. And we all, uh, thanks for the help promoting this, but most importantly for the, the work y'all do. Um, and sometimes that change does, does actually mount to a, a little bit after a month. I've been really looking forward to tonight's event with Tony Hiss for his new book, Rescuing the Planet protecting half the land to heal the earth. Tony Hess is the author of 15 books, including the award-winning The Experience of Place. He was a staff writer at The New Yorker for more than 30 years, was a visiting scholar at New York University for 25 years, and has lectured around the world. He lives in New York with his wife, young adult writer, Lois Metzger. 
His latest book, Rescuing the Planet, has been called a masterpiece among masterpieces, but also inspirational, beautiful, graceful, and a prospect that might give us a fighting chance. That last blurb is from Bill McKibben, whom we are lucky, very lucky, to also have tonight leading this conversation. Bill needs a little introduction uh, in Vermont. Um, he is an author, an educator, and an environmentalist. I had the great pleasure of hosting him for his last book, Falter, as a human game begun to play itself out, which is now available in paperback. Um, please welcome to Northshire, Bill McKibben and Tony Hiss. Uh, Tony, I think you were gonna uh, have some slides for us. Uh, thank you so much, David. Um, yes, I thought I'd begin by just showing a few pictures. Um, I'm so thrilled to be here with Bill, known him for so many years and admired him for all of those years. Uh, let's see if I can share screen. Is it coming through? Yes, indeed. Good. Good. Um, my book is about what's sometimes called the other environmental crisis, meaning the biodiversity crisis, but of course it's really part of the climate crisis as well. We are at imminent risk of losing something like a million species of plants and animals around the world. This, for instance, was the last day of the last northern white rhino in Kenya, Sudan, his name was whose beloved keeper came in for one last rub behind the ear uh, before sent, he was uh, let go. Um, this is Lonesome George, the last Pinta Island tortoise in the Galapagos who died two years ago at the age of 101. These deaths have forced us to coin a new word, a sad new word, the, the endling. An endling is the very last of its species. One of the reasons we got into trouble was we had such an either or idea of change. This was a very famous painting in this country in the 1870s called American Progress. Progress being that golden haired young lady without very many clothes on who was drifting across the continent from east to west, bringing light with her, bringing telegraph wires with her, bringing stagecoaches, and railroad trains and covered wagons. I happen to like train rides a lot, but I don't think they need to exist at the expense, as the earlier vision seemed to say, of the buffalo, of the Native Americans, and of that snarling bear down in the lower left-hand corner. Fortunately, quite a long time ago, think people began thinking beyond loss to bigger landscapes. One of the first was a craggy New England forester named Benton Mackay, who when he graduated from college in the year of 1900, celebrated by clambering up Stratton Mountain in Vermont. Now, there were no trails in those days. Shinning up to the top of the tallest tree he could find. Swaying from the top, he had this vision, what he later called a planetary feeling that he was really part of a single landscape that existed from Maine all the way down to Georgia along the ridges of the Appalachian Mountains. 21 years later, he published his essay proposing a trail along the mountaintops. This so inspired people that within the next 20, 12 years or so, thousands of volunteers all over the East came together to create the Appalachian Trail, which is now 2100 and 90 miles long, um, the only national park maintained by volunteers entirely, and it passes through 13 states. This is an end papers map I had commissioned for my book and Mackay's idea of the Appalachians and the landscape around them, what he called the Appalachian realm, is actually the smallest of the great four landscapes that define this continent. You'll see it running from top to bottom along the right-hand side of the map. Uh, it's paralleled in the west by the Rockies uh, and by a vision, a parallel vision that occurred to a Canadian activist and lawyer named Harvey Locke in the 1990s when he thought, I'm part of a single landscape that exists all the way from Yellowstone Park, all the way up to the top of the Yukon. And he called it 
Yellowstone to Yukon or Y to Y, and they've now protected something like 20% of that, uh, 2,500 mile long landscape. Um, we're fortunate in this continent to have such a beautiful geography that helps us think and retain in our minds the landscapes that are ours. Across the top of the landscape is the of the continent is the most extraordinary of all the great boreal forest in Canada and Alaska. 3,700 miles long, 1,000 miles from top to bottom. It's probably the most wild and most intact landscape left anywhere on the planet. Um, you can go for, in a plane for just hour after hour after hour and see nothing but black spruce trees and an occasional moose. One of the most wonderful places I've ever been to. A city kid from New York was just overwhelmed by a chance to visit the boreal. Down at the bottom of the continent, we've got the most recently recognized large landscape, the North American Coastal Plain Biodiversity Hotspot. Well, it's a good thing we started thinking big when we did because we'd we were already confronted by the fact that traditional ways of doing conservation, setting aside landscapes and saying that's where animals ought to be, were inadequate. The national parks were already losing species. This was as early as 1988, partly because the species had different ideas of where they wanted to be. And also if development began to encircle the parks, the animals who had wandered out couldn't get back in again. So gradually science has been coming up with this idea of protecting 50% of the landscape, half earth is sometimes called, or nature needs half. Why half? It's one of the questions I get asked most frequently. Well, there's a series of scientific studies showing that creatures need to retain at least half of their original habitat on average in order to thrive, sometimes it's less than that, it could be 30%, sometimes it's a lot more, 75%. But half is a good balance in the middle. Also, Edmund o, Edward O. Wilson, the great Harvard biologist and champion of biodiversity who I got to meet when I started to work on this book, um, ha, is able to come up with predictive math saying, if we protect only 15% of the landscape, as we now do, we can only hope to retain about a quarter of the species. But if we bump that up to 50%, we can hope to retain and save 85 to 90% of the plants and animals, not everything, but pretty much everything. I'd like you to look for a moment into the fierce eyes of this Russian biologist, Vladimir Ivanovich Vernadsky, who in the 1920s wrote the first definitive book about the biosphere. That layer of life that encompasses us and everything else that lives. He was the one who pointed out that it was immensely ancient, 3.8 billion miles, billion years old, we would now say at least, immense from side to side and seemingly ex inexhaustible since it stretches around the globe, but it has this third dimension too, its height, or rather its lack of height. Almost every creature lives in a band between the bottom of the ocean up to the top of Mount Everest. That's a span of 12 and a half miles. Laid out horizontally, it's a distance you could travel across in 20 minutes on a decent road. Think of that, traveling from one end of life to the other in 20 minutes. So it's both immeasurably uh, productive and at the same time by its very structure, precarious. We continue to find amazing things in, in its abundance and wonderfulness. Uh, this is a spider that some Indian scientists discovered just a few years ago and deliberately gave the name Areovixia gryffindori to because it reminded them so much of the sorting hat and the Harry Potter books. And they thought if people could associate spiders and Harry Potter, they might learn to love spiders a little bit more. Uh, on the right is an African vulture that can fly so high, one of them once collided with a jetliner. So within this seemingly inexhaustible but precarious substance that we live within, the biosphere, there seem to be three 
ours that are going to govern what we need to do to retain the species, retain what's still wild, restore what was once wilder, reconnect places that have gotten disconnected along the way. I mentioned the boreal before. The boreal is very much one of those landscapes that's both part of fighting climate change and retaining bi the uh, biodiversity. It has two nicknames. It's called North America's Bird Nursery because billions of songbirds and shorebirds fly up there every year to raise the next generation. It's also called the Fort Knox of Carbon because if all the carbon in all those trees and in all the soil and peat underneath them were to be released in a moment, it would be something like 37 years worth of fossil fuel emissions released into the atmosphere simultaneously. The boreal is special in another way too because the Canadians are now turning to the people who've lived there for 10,000 years, the Native Americans of the boreal forest, the First Nations as they're called in Canada, and making them the rangers of a whole vast new series of national parks. Um, mucklucks on the ground, they're calling them. And this is going to be able to help the Canadians who've taken as their goal to save at least 25% of that country by the year 2025, reach that goal. And beyond that, they're part of a consortium of high ambition countries as they call themselves that have pledged to protect 30% of themselves by 2030. And that's a first step towards what Ed Wilson was calling 50 by 50 or half earth. Um, it's a name I came up with in conversation with him one day. Um, interestingly enough, 10 years ago when I started working on this book, Ed Wilson was throwing out huge numbers like 50% just as a way of kicking people awake. It was what he would call at that time a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal. Not something he thought might necessarily get accomplished, although some, sometimes it works, like when President Kennedy said, let's put a man on the moon in 10 years. But it's a subject that's been catching up with itself just in the time I've been working on it. And now 50 by 50 doesn't sound quite so preposterous, but just something people have begun to hear about. And they will hear a lot more about it later this year because 196 countries are going to meet in China in October and pledge themselves to that interim 30 by 30 goal. Other ideas are coming back to the front as 50 by 50 begins to seep into our heads. A only a few people have been able to see the biosphere as a whole by getting up in rocket ships beyond, beyond the the surface of the earth, they all seem to report that ever after the earth seems to be a special and precious and precarious place. It's called the overview effect. I think what's now seeping into the rest of us is what I would call the inner view effect, a sense of that precariousness and wonderfulness that can grow in us who are down here and will stay down here. Back in the 1970s, the National Park Service realized that all over the country, people adored landscapes that were unprotected, that were special to them. And they created a map, which they were thinking of as a treasure map of these landscapes. And they had a way of coming to deal with these landscapes that would protect them, a way that was pioneered not far from Northshire, up in the Adirondacks, the great Adirondack Park, 6 million acres, only half of it though is in public ownership, the rest is in private hands. But the agreement is it will change only in ways that retain its specialness. Well, here are all these other potential landscape parks, green line parks that are called all over the country. This was going to have been the great environmental initiative and legacy of the second Jimmy Carter administration. Only of course there never was a second Jimmy Carter administration as he got whomped by Ronald Reagan in 1980. But now the idea, as we begin to assimilate the interview, is coming back into people's heads. And one of those treasured landscapes is right here in Saratoga County. Saratoga, thanks to Saratoga Plan and others, is having its own many-eyed Macayan moment, looking 
at the um, looking at the uh, Palmer Town Range as a special place, a uh, place that provides drinking water, as someone called it, a natural Brita filter, that also protects plants and animals, that also could be given its own Makayan sense of a oneness by running a trail along the length, linking up areas that are already protected. That extraordinary vision is now coming into being thanks to the many citizens of the area and with the great help of Saratoga Plan. Among bird watchers and birders, there's this phrase spark bird, referring to that bird which first somehow wormed its way into their minds um, many years ago, blasted its way into their lives, would never let go of them afterwards and changed their whole nat sense of where they were and what they were connected to and became a lifelong companion. But that same kind of reconnection can happen to anyone, anywhere. It doesn't have to be a bird, it could be a chance of seeing a vista, it could be a chance of uh, seeing wildflowers in the spring, so many things, or it could be shinning up a tall tree on top of a mountain like Benton Mackay and getting that planetary feeling. I'm so grateful to Northshire, one of the great independent bookstores, one of two of the great independent bookstores in the country for promoting this event. We can't do regular book signings, but in the meantime, we do offer the social distancing special. Knopf would be happy to send book plates uh, with my signature on them to anyone who wants them. And my own twist on this is if anyone tells people at Northshire they would like a book plate that is personally inscribed to them, all Northshire has to do is send me their name and I will be happy to send back one that I've signed myself. And now it's time for me to talk to someone I have loved and admired for so many years, Bill McKibben. I think of Bill as the anti-poisoner of the planet, the man who's for helping provide the antidote, administering the anti-venom to the planet, cleansing us uh, with all the people that he has inspired with his tremendous energy, with his wonderful uh, writing skills. Um, it's, it's a treat to... to wow. Tony, what a pleasure to get to see you and to welcome you to the virtual North Country, where it's an absolutely spectacular day. Um, uh, finally, after a long, cold, damp spring, it's a real pleasure to greet the sun and to greet you and to be able to say thank you for this book and also for a lifetime of work. Just so people know, I've known Tony a very long time. I arrived at the New Yorker magazine uh, one week after I left college at the age of 21 to write the talk of the town. And my first day there, Tony, who I'd never met, appeared at my door and commandeered me off to lunch at the uh, Oyster Bar at Grand Central. And uh, we've been friends ever since. I had the great pleasure of helping edit his remarkable book, The Experience of Place. And it's really, I mean, even more than, than reading, editing is a good way to understand just how gifted a writer can be, because you can see um, um, right from the beginning all the ways that ideas get shaped. There's really, I, I think, almost nobody better at uh, describing a, a, a place and, and making it intellectually real too, understanding that it exists in many dimensions, including the dimension of history and the dimension of what's coming in the future. And that's why this new book is so crucial and so hopeful at a moment when it's actually fairly hard to be hopeful about too much on our planet. Um, the, um, and I'm very glad that, he, that Tony paid a little homage to, our, uh, to the uh, park just north of Saratoga uh, 20 years, 30 years before Benton Mackay climbed that tree on Stratton Mountain, the legislature of the state of New York set aside the land within the blue line as forever wild. And really there have been few times in human history when uh, politicians have been um, more poetic and more farsighted and we owe them a 
great deal. I know I do since I've spent much of my life uh, in that glorious wilderness. And it immediately raises the question, Tony, one I, I want you to talk about a little bit about, um, about one of the things that seems most crucial about what you're talking about here, which is scale, size. You know, we went from a period, um, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years ago when say the Nature Conservancy was concentrating on very, very small pieces of land, saving five acres here or there on the theory that some particular orchid or some particular butterfly was resident there and that by saving this small chunk, they could be saved. Um, the Nature Conservancy now talks about working on a landscape scale. And Ed Wilson, who used to talk about how we could preserve just a few small biodiversity hotspots and with it, uh, uh, much of the world's um, um, splendor. Um, now, as you say, is making the point that we need to think much, much bigger. Um, how, what's the kind of uh, uh, history of that understanding of scale over these last few decades? Well, it actually goes back a hundred years, Bill, which is what is fascinating. Um, there was a wonderful landscape architect named Warren Manning, uh, a leader in his profession a hundred years ago. And um, his business dried up during World War I, so he devoted himself just because he thought he could do it to creating a national plan, looking forward to the future of the United States. Uh, never published 450 pages, but a spectacular accomplishment. And he proposed setting aside something like 30% of the landscape. Uh, in many ways, it, it, if you lay his map on top of maps people are making now, uh, a lot of simultaneous uh, uh, overlap. So thinking big is something that's part of our heritage. Mackay was 21, uh, headed for the top of Stratton instead of the New Yorker uh, when he graduated from college um, and, and was overcome by this planetary feeling. Um, and then I talked about the Yellowstone to Yukon uh, we also are, in the last 20 and 30 years, reinforced our thinking is reinforced by the thinking of the animals themselves. We finally reached the point where we can put collars and tags on animals that are tiny enough uh, so that they don't disturb them and, and that can broadcast a, a signal that can actually be picked up by satellites. So the co-founder of Yellowstone to Yukon was a wolf named Pluey who was caught in a rainstorm near Banff National Forest up in Canada of cold fluid because of the drenching rain, uh, collared, let loose. Scientists thought, well, probably travel maybe 50 to 60 miles. It was known that wolves wander around a bit. But then the signal went dead and they thought, oh, well, um, that's what happens when you do science. Um, several months later, someone from NASA called up and said, we've got your wolf down here on our screens, um, please get in touch. Well, Pluey had traveled down to Idaho um, beyond where the Banff scientists thought of looking for her. And over the next 18 months, she traversed an area 10 times the size of Yellowstone National Park through three US states and two Canadian provinces. So it was clear that our whole think way of thinking, our scientific way of thinking about uh, the needs of animals like these predator, top predators was very outdated. Uh, Fluey's collar is now hung in an honored place in the Yellowstone to Yukon offices. So we, we can now ask the animals to tell us their stories too. And it's reached the point where this wonderful German biologist who studied here in the States for a long time, Martin Vikelski, has set up what he calls Icarus, which is going to be a way of, there are now antennae on the space station, going to be able to pick up 300,000 signals from animals simultaneously and track their movements all over the world. One of the reasons my book is a hopeful book, as you said, Bill, is because in I, when I got to travel all over North America to, to talk to people, it was extraordinary how much work was being done. Some of it harking back to people like 
Warren Manning and, and of course, Mackay, but others just arising now and people doing all kinds of things at all different scales, many of them not realizing what someone else on the other side of the ridge was up to, but all sort of simultaneously working together. And at the same time, in many cases, consciously working together groups that in the past had thought of themselves as less interested in what the other guy was doing. Well, for instance, in the um, Saratoga area, you've got trails people working together with land conservation people. That used to be two different, two different groups. Uh, but now they and the water protectors are all working simultaneously to protect this wonderful landscape, which can shape the growth of this fastest growing county in New York State for the next 50 to 100 years. It's, it's also happening because it's crunch time, which of course you've been trying to tell people since the 1980s. Um, and it's now beginning to dawn on us that that's the case with the plants and animals, as well as with the atmosphere and the water and the land that gets poisoned by the way we've done business. Tony, uh, let me first just say to everybody listening, um, if you have questions uh, in about 12 or 15 minutes, we're gonna switch over to everybody else's questions, not mine. So put them in the chat and then uh, Rachel and David will be on top of them. But I have a few things to, um, to, to ask first. Um, one is, you know, we've, we're starting to, um, we're starting to think more about, I mean, there used to be a strong separation between the idea that a place was wild and the place had any people in it at all. One of the things that's interesting about the Adirondacks is that there, you know, more than most places, people and wilderness live fairly close together in kind of interpenetrating ways. Um, there's also now uh, uh, increasing call for um, turning over uh, land management uh, of a lot of these areas to indigenous people, to Native Americans or natives of other parts of the world um, who, do, who, who don't think of them often as being separated into wild and settled places. What's the, what do you think the kind of future of that, um, of these kind of more ambiguous arrangements are? Well, I think that um, this is one of the keys to the future. Uh, we're only just beginning to catch up to the multifaceted understanding of the land that has been inherent in so many uh, indigenous peoples for 10,000 years or more. This is certainly what's saving uh, Canada's ambitions at the moment, saving Canada's Canadian bacon, shall we say, um, by turning over vast tracts of uh, land up there in the boreal forest to people who've always been there and making them officially the guardians, the indigenous guardians of this landscape at scales that are far bigger than what we think of as, as national parks uh, and appropriate size for national parks. In fact, when I was up there, I was so overwhelmed, I sort of had to jerry-rig in my mind a new set of measurements. Uh, the, uh, one Y, one Yellowstone was sort of the basic coin of the realm. But beyond that was one Cal, one California equal to 50 Ys. Well, up there in uh, the boreal, with all the, if all the plans that have been announced get implemented in the next 10 years, something like one Cal plus 30 Ys is going to be protected. Something we, it's a scale we can't dream of, but that is commonplace into the th thinking of the indigenous people and that showing that we're just catching up to their sophistication. One of the indigenous leaders I talked to said, well, when I talk to biologists and, and I honor my own training as a biologist too, the general thought is if we're thinking about the future of caribou, we've got to think about at least 25 years ahead. My people uh, try to think at least 400 years ahead because otherwise we can't guarantee the future of the caribou. So yes, this is a tremendous asset, finally recognizing the expertise and uh, welcoming 
the participation of the indigenous people. When Europeans reached Australia in the 18th century, there was this pernicious legal doctrine, terra nullius, which meant nobody's land, land that belongs to nobody. And that's why, because with their blinkered eyes, they couldn't see that because the trees hadn't been chopped down and turned into fields, that there was anything there. Um, it, they just thought it was something waiting for them. Whereas in fact, it was in such wonderful shape because it had been nourished and tended by the aboriginals for 40,000 years. So we, maybe you can think about terra tata, land that's been saved and protected uh, for the planet. I want to emphasize for people this, um, something I know you know, but I want you to sort of comment on, um, which is the element of time here and the, and the interplay now of uh, all sorts of forces. We had a report this week, a scientific paper, two report, two scientific papers this week that were quite ominous. One showed that in the Amazon, the Amazon forest had now switched from being a carbon sink to a carbon source. That is, it was now giving up because enough of it had been deforested and because it was getting warmer and hence drier, uh, the trees were now, uh, the forest as a whole, trees and soil were giving off more carbon than they were sequestering. And then a week later is the same report from the boreal forest of Canada uh, that it had flipped um, um, and, and I think that what's important to understand about that is that in, in an earlier era, one could draw lines on a map with some confidence that one what one was protecting would sort of stay in place. But that's no longer the case. Uh, we're, we're changing the world in such profound ways that it's escaping uh, from our boundaries, even when we try to protect things which why to me is so important in so many ways that uh, conservation be working hand in hand with efforts also to take care of these other huge uh, uh, problems that we face, climate change above all, because they're so linked in so many ways. Um, you know, if, if the Canadian boreal forest is catching on fire and the Siberian boreal forest in ways that we've never seen before, simply because it's gotten hot and dry. When it does, it not only destroys that habitat, uh, or at least impairs it, but it puts huge clouds of carbon into the atmosphere that uh, serve as feedback loops to this whole cycle. So I, I, I think it's really important for people to understand this, but I think the thing I'd like you to get it sort of uh, give you enormous credit for and like you to just kind of talk a little bit more about um, most of the most of the view that we've held as a society around environmentalism in recent years has been a, a kind of preventative effort to hold off really um, horrible future, and which is really true and really important. But now you're holding out this vision of something um, um, beyond that of a really glorious future of a planet that works better than it worked when we came onto this earth. Um, and it seems to me that that, that that vision is at the kind of psychological heart of the possibilities here and what it might mean. Well, um, I, people I talk to in the boreal think it's perhaps premature to think of it as having lost its carbon sink status. Uh, so, but clearly the Amazon has been teetering for quite some time. We had ominous reports from there again and again and again. Uh, it's, it, it is an urgent situation uh, and it's going to require a combination of approaches to make anything happen. To, on the one hand to retain what's still wild, but on the other hand to make wilder those places that have let where the wildness has been tamed or uh, impaired with, and then the reconnecting of places. And I think that's a, a tremendous uh, new advance, seeing that by putting together places that as single localities could only do so much, but by connecting them up, they become greater than the whole. Um, 
So that means working at many scales as well as in many ways at the same time. Um, and it's not a foregone conclusion, but I was so impressed by the energy and the hope and um, the effectiveness of all the people I was in touch with as I ran around the continent. Uh, Canadians in many ways uh, outshining what we've been doing so far. But I also talked to this wonderful woman in Northern Mexico who's brought water back to a bone dry ranch. So lots of wonderful things are happening and can happen. And the fact that this country now has for the first time, this national conservation goal of protecting at least 30%, it's just a way station, but it's a goal we've never even posited for ourselves previously. Um, that's one way of galvanizing people. And as Makai used to say, um, optimism is oxygen. Uh, and when you uh, feel like you can do something, you're suddenly capable of doing a lot more. The, um, what, do, what do we think, talk about, you're talking about uh, terrestrial um, uh, conservation here. Um, how does this extend in people's thinking? In, I mean, you know, if, if one was naming our planet, honestly, we'd call it ocean, not earth. Right. Um, how does this extend into the marine sphere when you think about oh, it? Oh, it extends directly into the marine sphere and the marine protected areas are every bit as important and, uh, and critical to the survival of life as uh, land protected areas. I think one new estimate was at least 35% of the oceans need to be in no take zones. Um, and, the, and there, the good news is that they show the signs of rebounding quite quickly. If you actually do stop fishing, uh, the little fish come back, the big fish come back, uh, everything else in between and submicroscopic stuff as well. And that makes the fishing on the edges beyond the no-take zone that much more plentiful. So it can support sustainable fisheries in a way uh, that wasn't possible when everyone was just in there light, letting down their nets and their reels and dragging whatever they could out of the ocean. So yes, it's, it's two parts of the same process. Uh, and we probably need along the edges, sort of marine urban parks as well, uh, where the estuaries meet the sea. That's something Plymouth, England seems to be uh, inventing all by itself, even though it wants the country to follow behind it. Uh, and I just was a part of a panel talking about the New York Harbor and New York, New Yorkers, well, as you remember as a former New Yorker, don't realize that they live on the edge of one of the great wildnesses uh, of the planet, the Hudson River, which is now a whole lot cleaner than it used to be. And it's a mile wide and a mile deep and incredible critters down there that we, because it's naturally silty, we can't see, but that are just as important anyway. So, well, it's hard not to bubble over with uh, the good news. It's, um, it's always fun for, uh, for us to think of the Hudson as a big broad thing in New York, in New York City, because we think of it as a uh, laughing, dancing uh, river up in the Adirondacks or is the very, very beautiful strand that makes its way south from Glens Falls. Um, um, one of the things that people should just bear in mind is that we also on this coast have examples like that why to why thing. One of the things that people have worked on hard over the years here is the effort to uh, connect the Adirondacks with the Algonquin Park, the A to A corridor. Yes. Um, which would be a, and, and of course, these things become all the more important as the climate warms because we need ways for plants and animals to move north, which is what they're going to have to do to survive. Um, and so these are, these corridors are more important than they've ever been. Um, what are the, before we turn to the good questions that are assembling from the audience, just uh, a practical question. Um, Joe Biden has announced this plan for 30 by 30 um, uh, uh, conservation effort, which really is a remarkable um, vision. How do we, what are the, what are the 
places where it's going to need support in the federal government, and how should we be plugging into that? What do we what what are what are going to be the sticking points? Well, I think um, they've learned their lesson, and they're now saying. Um, we're not here to take anything away from you. We're here to assist efforts that are underway. Uh, so efforts like Adirondack to Algonquin or one that I've been in touch with, um, the watershed of the Chesapeake Bay, which is an enormous area that stretches from just south of the Adirondacks all the way down to Virginia, um, crossing a number of states, People there have already banded together and come up with a plan for protecting their own goal is 50 by 50 of that area, 50% of that area by 2050. But they need funding for, uh, for being able to conserve the places that they've already drawn up a list for. So the Fish and Wildlife Service is trying to come up with a plan for that. Uh, Chesapeake Wild, uh, this is something ready-made for the new Biden administration. Also on the Delmarva Peninsula, the people there, another extraordinary landscape. They are a weird name because it's divided between three states. It's part Del, Delaware, part Mar, part Maryland, part Va, Virginia. You'd think they would never have a common vision, but they have. And they, they want to protect 50% of that landscape by 2030, uh, farmland and natural land. And again, this is something that uh, in America, the beautiful program, the name of Biden people seem to be giving the 30 by 30 effort, uh, could just step in and be of assistance to. Um, one of the lucky things about this continent is that less than 40% of the landscape is used by humans. So it's not like anyone needs to be displaced uh, in order to make things work for all species. Uh, even when we accept a larger population, which we expect will have to have before we start shrinking again. Um, so uh, there's a great deal that's, what did they call it back in 1908? Shovel ready, uh, when they were trying to dig out of that recession. Projects that people all over the country outside of government have been working on. And now it's the government that needs to reach out to them. Um, that's part of the good news. Well, these are your, your your vision is remarkable, and as we turn it over to people to to uh, to David and Rachel for questions, I just want to say, um, Tony is a great speaker, but he's an even better writer. And this book was a classic the day that it was published, and it's a book that people need for their libraries. Not the the the, the words are the heart of it, but the uh, uh, map, the, the end papers, and things are are classic as well. Uh, this is a, a remarkable vision of what our what we could still accomplish, even on a straightened and and hurting planet. And so we're just a, an, owe you an enormous debt, Tony, for bringing all your um, all your skill to bear on this and all your big heart to many, many thanks. Now I know we have some questions from. Well, thank audience. you, Bill. Thanks so much, Bill. Uh, first off, we've got a question from Scott. It says, uh, can you talk a bit about how climate change and the biodiversity crisis in the animal kingdom are linked? Are these case, are there case studies showing if we allow temperatures to continue to rise, then we'll lose a certain num X number of species and how that'll impact us? Well, clearly they're linked um, because we know that animals are moving around as a result of climate change in addition to the way they move around anyway, uh, moving upslope, moving north. That's one of the reasons why it's so important to protect not just the Appalachian Trail, but the Appalachian realm that Mackay talked about, the landscape around it, um, because animals will be moving northward, probably. So yes, uh, these two emergencies are intertwined inexplicably inextricably, there's no way, no way out of it. Um, and everything that helps the planet be less poisoned is going to help the species uh, have a better chance of surviving. And anything that, and, and by protecting landscapes in which the species are providing oxygen, 
and uh, and the other so-called ecosystem services, as we now call them, water uh, and uh, and the, just the abundance of, and complexity of life, um, is helping the climate change crisis. So again, this is yet another coalition that is coming into being just in the nick of time. Uh, but time still has that nick, I think. Thank you, that's a great answer. Um, there's a question here from Maria, who spoke to us in the beginning about her work with Saratoga Plan. Um, she says, I constantly encounter a lack of understanding that the biosphere is our life support system and a disconnect that conservation is essential for life. What have you found effective in conveying how critical protecting natural lands is for the future of all species, including humans? Well, I think I ran across the work of a remarkable Englishman named J. Ralph Audi, who coined the term Ips effect. He said, all species come into this world and sort of treat it as a fixer upper, a place that they could make a little better for themselves. That's why birds build nests uh, to make it easier to raise families, why beavers build dams. Humans have gone beyond anything other species have done in terms of rejiggering the place for our own comfort. And we sometimes think uh, that that's all there is around us and, and only see the things we've brought to pass and think and take credit for that and not see that they're based on the, the natural resources that were here before we began the tinkering. Um, anyone who wants to reconnect, it's very easy to, because everyone is in an ecosystem wherever they are, whether you're down here in Greenwich Village uh, in Manhattan or up in the beautiful North Country where you guys have the luck to be. Um, it's just inescapable uh, that there, there it is. Um, every breath you take, half of, what is it? Every other breath, the oxygen has been provided to you by phytoplankton in the oceans. And the breaths in between have been provided to you by the trees. So we breathe out and we provide carbon dioxide for the trees we breathe in and thank the trees for what they've given us. We're linked whether we want to think about it or not. There's nothing we can do to dissolve that link. There's a question here from Doug in Putney. He says, what do you think about cooling the Arctic to restore the polar albedo, restore the polar tropic heat gradient, which is the cause of the wandering vortex, like in freezing Texas, forestall subsea methane release, curtail Greenland, ice sheet melt, all those options. I went to school in Putney, so I'm delighted to hear a question from Putney. Um, I think that um, these big bioengineering schemes, one that I've heard of that made more sense to me was taking the water, pumping out the water that's coagulating down at the bottom of glaciers, uh, because that's what makes glaciers slippery. And once they get into the sea, they begin to melt. If we could pump that water out, uh, a lesser task, um, then they might cling to the rocks better than they have been in recent years. So yes, we've got to think at huge scales, but I think trying to keep the poles as cold as possible is going to be of great value. So we are just about out of time, but there is one last quick question from Scott. Um, asking, are there currently state level maps identifying the areas that are a priority for preservation? There are maps all over the place, Scott. And if you look uh, at, for instance, Saratoga Plans maps, they've mapped not only what uh, that mountainous area looks like now, uh, but what it will look like 50 years from now under several different scenarios. If uh, growth proceeds unchecked the way it has been, uh, pretty much everything that's natural and farm disappears, but there are alternatives. So groups that work on each areas um, are mapping those areas and the specialness of those areas. The states are catching up. There are great geological survey maps. Um, 
But mapping is one of the great needs because at least for those of us like me who love to pour over maps and get information from them, uh, that's part of making all of this possible and real for people. I, I can't thank you people enough for putting on this event tonight and making it possible for me to have a chat with Bill McKibben, my, one of my favorite people in the world. Um, and using the auspices of this marvelous bookstore uh, to convene this conversation. And thanks too, of course, to Saratoga Plan for helping out with this and also for helping out with the future of the Saratoga region. Thank you both so much. This has been a fantastic event. We really appreciate it. Uh, Tony, Bill, this, is, this has been great. Thank you all. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Enjoy this beautiful evening, everybody. Have a great evening. Thank you and good night.